Shannon Bream and the Fox News at Night team. Take it from here, Miss Shannon. We are always up for some ice cream, Laura, and this is also <laughs> what we'll be talking about tonight. North Korea test fires an intercontinental ballistic missile theoretically capable of hitting every city in the United States. Less than a month after President Trump warned Pyongyang, do not try us. Fire, frankly, than any previous shot. With each test inching North Korea closer to perfecting nuclear weapons, the president says all options are on the table. Tax reform clears a key hurdle in the Senate without any help from the Democrats. They decided not to show up. Will a photo op with empty chairs bring Democrats back to the table? Steyerwalt looks at the president's latest negotiating tactic, plus a major win for the president in his showdown with Senator Elizabeth Warren. And there's this. The whole relationship is sick. Why is the media lashing out at conservative women? At the same time, a conversation about sex harassment is heating up. Hello and welcome to Fox News at Night. I'm Shannon Bream in Washington. Very busy tonight. We are learning new details about North Korea's latest provocation, launching an intercontinental ballistic missile many believe could be capable of hitting the continental U.S. The launch was met by a show of force by South Korea and a vow by our president, quote, it will be taken care of. The missile was launched from a North Korean military base on a test trajectory into orbit. It flew 2,800 miles into space for a total of 50 minutes. That is 10 times higher than the orbit of NASA's International Space Station. Then, the missile splashed down off the coast of Japan. According to reporting by South Korea's news agency, launched from a different angle, the missile could have reached Hawaii, even the U.S. West Coast. And higher, frankly, than any previous shot they've taken. The bottom line is it's a continued effort to build a threat, sir, a ballistic missile threat that uh, endangers world peace, regional peace, and certainly the United States. Missile experts tell us that North Korea appears to be trying to perfect a nuclear warhead. South Korea says it can't rule out the possibility that North Korea will complete its nuclear program within a year. This was the third test flight of an ICBM by North Korea. It came shortly after President Trump put Pyongyang back on the state sponsor of terrorism list. Buck Sexton is a former CIA analyst, joins us now live. Hello, Buck. Good to see you, Shannon. All right, what do you make of this? Uh, there had been rumblings yesterday. We had General Keene here last night talking about the fact that there had been uh, indications that another launch was coming after really a relatively quiet couple of months. What do you make of this latest threat? Well, Shannon, we're running out of options and we're running out of time. Uh, this was a, a period that people were hoping would end with at least some opening for diplomacy, that there would be uh, some different path that the regime in Pyongyang would be willing to take uh, in response to the pressures that have been applied. The Trump administration has been very aggressive in dealing with this issue and very forthright in that it's going to work with uh, regional countries, some allies, some the relationship's a bit more complicated than that on this issue, uh, but trying to get more pressure on North Korea economically and, and diplomatically. And when this is the response, this act of extreme defiance from Kim Jong-un, it's incredibly discouraging because time is not on our side here. They are on a progression. They are moving mm -hmm. closer and closer to being able to hit us with a nuclear weapon here on the U.S. homeland, as we know. And we can't just continue to hope that diplomacy will work. So, as I said, there aren't any good options, and the options are getting smaller and smaller as time goes on. Yeah, and our president has said everything is on the table. All options are on the table, although other members of the administration really want to back away from any conversation about having to use any kind of military options. I want to play a little bit of sound that comes to us from the chair of the House Armed Services Committee. This is a Republican Mac Thornberry about what they're doing and how we're responding. With each launch, they are advancing their capability and they are making it clear that they can hold the entire U.S. at risk. They are steadily moving on and we're not responding in kind. Okay, so we've responded in kind with increasing uh, sanctions. They're back on the state sponsor of terror list. What other responses do you think we have at this point? Well, quite honestly, I think the administration's doing everything that it reasonably can. There's an understanding that China has the greatest leverage by far of any country in the world when it comes to dealing with North Korea. And in the aftermath of President Trump's visit, I, I think it's been quite clear from a policy standpoint that they're trying to rally all of our Asian allies and, and Asian partners 
uh, current and, and future on this issue to try to get them to put more pressure on North Korea. But here's the simple reality, Shannon, and it's a very uncomfortable one for us to address. There is no economic pressure that we are going to bring to bear that anyone is aware of right now that will lead North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons program. It just does not exist. I haven't heard of one. I don't think anybody who follows the issue closely believes there is one. The best we could hope for, and that is what the hope had been over the last 10 weeks or so, had been that there would be a period where they wouldn't be trying to aggressively advance their missiles program and the possibility of a nuclear warhead atop it. And now we've seen that that's gone away. So it's as though the clock has been reset for another opening, another way to approach this issue. But we are running out of time. Once North Korea knows that they can hit us, and once that becomes understood around the world, there's the possibility of blackmail. Keep in mind, North Korea doesn't just have to hit us with a nuke to cause all kinds mm -hmm. of problems. Nuclear proliferation is a major issue. North Korean cyber hacking is a tremendous issue, as well as support to rogue regimes and terrorist groups all over the world with near impunity. Because when they know that regime change or an invasion or anything like that is off the table because of a nuclear capacity that can hit us, changes the whole game. Yeah, and we know that there are other bad actors involved with assisting and getting assistance from North Korea on this nuclear front. I also want to ask you about big news in the Benghazi story and that ongoing scandal because we've talked about it. You've covered it as we have for years now uh, in watching over this. Now, today we get uh, a conviction of Abu Qatala, uh, not on the biggest of charges, but a few charges that will keep him behind bars, it sounds like, for life. Sentencing's coming up. No date on that just yet. But he was one of the actors in Benghazi that led to the deaths of four Americans. Some of the reactions coming in today. Charles Woods, he's Ty Woods' father. Ty Woods died there bravely trying to defend other Americans. His father says this is outrageous. It is a miscarriage of justice. Pat Smith, her son Sean Smith, also bravely died there trying to help protect the ambassador who died. She says, my son died a horrible death. I think the people who bear responsibility, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, aren't even touched. We're also hearing from one of the survivors of this attack. He says that this guy who was convicted today, he's going to have to enter a greater court, give a greater account to a greater judge, and I have no doubt he will receive a greater sentence. That's from Mark Geis, one of the uh, wounded survivors of that attack that night. Your reaction? Well, there are two issues here, right? On the one hand, you have the judicial process and the hopes that there would be some justice that would come from this. There'll, there'll never be true justice for the families of the fallen in Benghazi. Uh, there's nothing the court system can ever truly do, uh, but I would just reiterate the words of the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, my, my former uh, home agency, which is that uh, this is a measure of justice, but it's really not enough. The fact that this individual, Katala, was not found guilty of specifically murder and, and will not face the death penalty feels like the Justice Department here, or, or at least in this case, it came up short. And I know that, that that stings. And for those who are looking for closure as well as justice, it's just simply not enough. And then on the issue of accountability, the only period in which I think there was going to be any accountability at a political level, very different from the criminal level for Benghazi, was in the 2012 election. I think that the people who were involved knew that. They worked very hard to make sure that the narrative was suppressed and that the truth was suppressed. And by the time we had enough facts to hold anybody accountable from 2012 in the chain of command at the very top, the Secretary of State, the President himself, it was too late. Well, Katala will, as we said, uh, probably spend many decades, if not life, uh, in prison. But again, not uh, being convicted of those most serious charges, as you said, that doesn't bring these folks back. It doesn't bring comfort to their families. Uh, but you can see their disappointment today. Um, Buck Sexton, great to have you with us. Thank, Thank you, Shannon. Good to see you. And just coming in, this Fox News alert in Tampa, police are announcing an arrest in connection with four fatal shootings within a month in the city's Seminole Heights neighborhood. Remember, they were talking about, do we have a serial killer here on our hands? Well, what we're hearing tonight is this. Tampa Police Chief Brian Dugan making an announcement a short time ago. Uh, the major saying, quote, goodness has won. And they're praising the officers and cops out there for potentially bringing this case, uh, believed, as we said, to be a serial killer to a close. We're going to monitor this for further details, and we'll let you know more as soon as we do. But that community has been on edge waiting for some kind of resolution. Is this going to be it? Meanwhile, tonight at this very moment, we're also watching reports of a possible active shooter in downtown Reno. Cops are urging people to avoid the area. No confirmed injuries at this time. Very few details. We'll try to get some more there for you, but we're keeping an eye on that, and we'll let you know when we get more. Tonight, another former staffer of Democratic Congressman John Conyers is accusing him of making sexual advances towards her. And now yet another Democrat is calling for the longest-serving member of the House to resign. 
Kristen Fisher is live with details. Good evening, Kristen. Hey, Shannon. This is now the third former staffer of Congressman Conyers to come forward with allegations of sexual harassment. Her name's Deanna Marsh. She says it happened three times between 1997 and 99. The last one, according to Marr, took place in a very public setting, a town hall meeting in his home district of Detroit. Listen to how she described it in an interview on CNN just tonight. He stuck his hand up my dress and whispered in my ear, wow, you've got great looking legs. And that is in front of everyone. Now, Conyers is a founding member of the Congressional Black Caucus, and tonight some of his colleagues are reportedly pressing him to resign. But the caucus's chairman is not one of them. He says he met with Conyers today and told him that any decision to resign before the ethics investigation is complete is up to him and him alone, Shannon. Mm. All right, we'll stand by on that. In the meantime, in addition to Congressman Conyers, now a second House Democrat accused of using taxpayer dollars to settle some kind of complaint with a former staffer? Yes, but to be very clear, this one has nothing to do with sexual harassment. This one involves Congressman Rahul Grijalva. And according to the Washington Times, which broke the story, back in 2015, one of his staffers threatened a lawsuit claiming that the Arizona Democrat was drunk on the job and creating a hostile work environment. Grijalva is acknowledging the payment, but he also says that he did nothing wrong and he's demanding an apology. He claims that, quote, the severance funds came out of my committee's operating budget. Every step of the process was handled ethically and appropriately. But the fact remains, Shannon, that there was a $48,000 payout funded ultimately by taxpayers. Perhaps just one more example of how taxpayer dollars are being used to hide some bad behavior on Capitol Hill, Shannon. Yeah, we're going to look at how that works at the state level with some of these offices as well. Uh, Kristen Fisher, thank you very much. Well, North Korean provocation and sex scandals aside, it was a really busy day on Capitol Hill where the president got directly involved in trying to move the GOP Senate tax plan forward. A key vote today and another one tomorrow on the Senate floor. Ed Henry is here tracking it all. He's got the very latest on this front. It was, whoa, whiplash today. Yeah, it was whiplash. And look, there's been a lot of negative talk, a lot of naysayers, but President Trump is now inching toward a major victory on tax cuts after putting his own deal-making skills to the test. What he did was he went to Capitol Hill, rolled up the sleeves over lunch with Senate Republicans, his hands-on leadership appearing to sway key Republicans, Senator Ron Johnson, telling us it was the president's personal attention that got him to yes. Johnson was one of 12 Republicans who voted to move the bill out of the Senate Budget Committee along party lines, significant because the Wisconsin Republican had warned he was leaning towards no unless taxes got lowered on so-called pass-through businesses. The president says he's going to take care of that. On the Hill, the president also had a private meeting with Republicans Lamar Alexander, Lindsey Graham, Susan Collins. You can see them there in that tweet. That appears to be moving Collins, a key moderate, towards yes on tax cuts because, again, the president personally agreed to support those controversial subsidies on Obamacare that could help stabilize the health premiums and the markets if this tax bill repeals the individual mandate. Now, major progress that came on a day that started out pretty negatively. As the president tweeted in the morning, quote, meeting with Chuck and Nancy today about keeping the government open and working. Problem is, they want illegal immigrants flooding into our country unchecked and weak on crime and want to substantially raise taxes. I don't see a deal, the president said. Well, that led Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi to boycott the White House meeting, charging the president is pushing the country towards a shutdown. The president fired back. He held that White House meeting anyway. The seats next to him, normally filled by Republicans, this time left empty with signs making clear they were supposed to have Democrats there, and they were not amused by that. They should be calling immediately and say, we want to see you, but probably they won't because Nothing to them is important other than raising taxes. That's the only thing they like doing is raising taxes. President Trump made sure that today's meeting is nothing but a photo op. These issues are far too serious for these kinds of games. Mr. President, it's time to stop tweeting and start leading. Now, after that meeting, Nancy Pelosi jumped in as well, tweeting, quote, at real Donald Trump now knows his verbal abuse will no longer be tolerated. His empty chair photo op showed he's more interested in stunts than addressing the needs of the American people. Poor Ryan and McConnell relegated to props. Sad. 
That reference by Nancy Pelosi mm -hmm. is something the president likes to say at the end of his tweets. But it's interesting because we're 10 days away from a government shutdown, yep. Shannon. He's moving closer to a tax cut deal. That's positive for him, but negative. They're moving closer and closer to government shutdown because they're so far apart. president just a short time ago tweeted out, we can't have a government shutdown because why? We need to fully fund the military mm -hmm. when we've got this threat from North Korea. You started the show off with it. It's urgent right now. People got to pay attention. The government, 10 days away from shutting down. Yeah, we, we're used to him tweeting early in the day, late tonight, too. He's bookending it. So. Morning news at night. And he, we're here, too. He is. He keeps us up to date. Uh, Ed, good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks. All right. Those empty chairs next to the president today. Just the latest hint at how partisan things have really gotten these days on Capitol Hill. Both sides playing chicken with a potential government shutdown looming, as Ed told us. Uh, Fox News Politics editor Chris Steyerwald joins us now from New York. What are you doing in New York City, Chris? We're checking up on you. We're seeing how America's responding <laughs> to you. And the answer is top drawer. Top okay, notch. excellent. Okay, so let's talk about this government shutdown idea because, listen, it doesn't matter who is responsible here because we know the president needs Democrats to work with him to avoid this. Isn't it the Republicans who always, I mean, the polling always shows us they always take the blame no matter who's really pulling the levers. Well, okay, the, yes and no. In uh, America, in the era of full partisan tribalism, it, everybody takes the blame. There's an, I'll put it this way. There's enough blame to go around. Mm -hmm. Certainly the preponderance of the blame falls on Republicans because they control both the executive branch and both houses of the legislative. We should also point out here, and this is worth mentioning, that the military isn't affected by a government shutdown, really. It's, mm -hmm. not like the, it's not like the Army says, well, I guess we have to go back because they have a shutdown in Washington. Well, it's a partial government shutdown. Yeah, and a lot of things still keep happening. The mail still keeps getting delivered. Uh, benefits get keep getting Social paid Security out. Checks, I mean, you know, right. it depends. But as to that shutdown situation, even when Democrats were in charge and running all the branches that the Republicans are now running, somehow the Republicans still got in trouble for shutting down the government, even when Democrats were in charge of everything. So what we know is that, listen, Republicans, the president, it's not good for them if it comes to that. Um, but he seems to be willing to play a little bit more chicken than your average president does on that front. Now, he was uh, working uh, the meetings today on Capitol Hill and uh, at the White House trying to get this package done. He knows he needs to succeed. And it's interesting because we had um, a description from inside the meeting. This comes to us from Senator Joe Kennedy uh, out of uh, Louisiana often very colorful in his descriptions. He said this today, that it was much different than the meetings they had about health care, much more positive. Nobody's standing up and storming out. Nobody's talking about anybody's mama. You know, nobody's talking <laughs> about anybody's Native American heritage. This was a positive meeting. Do you think they get it done, Chris? If we set the bar low enough, we can always succeed. If the, if the no yo mama jokes are the standard for a productive luncheon, then you can get there. There you go. Um, Here's the deal. The president has competing needs right now. On the one hand, he needs Republican unity. He needs Republican solidarity to get behind this tax plan. A lot of these guys don't like this bill. The bill is not popular. It's going to be a painful vote because it raises taxes on some people because it doesn't provide the relief to other people that they want. So it's not a popular bill, but he still needs them to take the vote for him because he needs a win. The party needs a win, and he's telling them to be loyal. A great way to create the sensation of loyalty is to attack the other side. Those mm -hmm. jerks, they want to raise taxes. They're the worst. Mm -hmm. They're horrible. Soft on crime, so you do soft that. Border. Da, 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 da. So you do that. Unfortunately, what that does then is it reminds everybody, including Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, mm -hmm. that they sort of have the president over a barrel when it comes to the end of the year spending package. He does need them because Congress has failed to act expeditiously on a number of things this year. We are ending up with this huge ball of sealing wax that is left for Congress to deal with in the final weeks of the year. Mm -hmm. And the president needs Democrats on all this stuff. So how do you invoke tribalism for Republicans to keep them fired up and ready to go, but simultaneously keep dem uh, prevent Democrats from raking over the coals constantly, that's a toughie. Yeah, well, in this joint statement today from uh, the top Democrat, Chuck Schumer on the Senate side, the top uh, Democrat on the House side, Nancy Pelosi, saying the president, who has already said earlier this year that our country needs a good shutdown, they're referencing back to that, isn't interested in addressing the difficult year and agenda. We'll work with those Republicans who are, as we did in April. We'll see if there's an end run around and they get something done on Capitol Hill. Otherwise, you and I both know we'll be hanging out here Christmas week waiting to see that's why it's... That's why, that's why we go till midnight, because that's when the shutdown happens. Yeah, we will be there. And hopefully there <laughs> won't be one to report on. That, but until then, exactly. uh, Chris, hurry home. Good to see you. Yes, ma'am. All right, coming up, we're going to get an update from Reno. We told you uh, there's a report there. Police are standing by a possible active shooter. Very few details. We'll check back on that and let you know. In the meantime, North Korea's nuclear ambitions, exactly what kind of threat does today's 
intercontinental ballistic missile launch posed to America. Congressman Trent Franks of the Armed Services Committee joins us live right here next. Plus, a big win for the president over his Senate rival, Elizabeth Warren. But this fight is far from over. Coming up, what happens next? Serves to be to be attacked, you know, and from the the kind of attack I got is kind of like what you'd get from a motor vehicle accident. I mean, I had six ribs broken, and you rarely see that even in an, an assault. I mean, it's something like you usually see in a high-speed motor vehicle accident. the Fox News alert. We want to update you on the situation in Reno. We told you about a potential shooter there. Uh, it, this is happening at an area called the Montage Condos in downtown Reno. Um, police have warned people to stay away from the area because of a possible active shooter. Now, what we're hearing from Officer Tim Broadway of the Reno PD, just updating reporters there on site, he says a suspect is in custody. They think apparently this was a domestic abuse situation that devolved into a possible hostage situation. A male suspect was barricaded inside the condos, and cops say he was shooting down into the street. A woman was shot in the hand. The suspect has been shot by police. Obviously, the police there in Nevada on edge in the wake of the Vegas shooting. Uh, so it looks like a domestic situation gone bad. The shooter now uh, mobilized, immobilized there. We'll keep you updated as we learn more. In September, North Korea released footage of what it claimed was leader Kim Jong-un inspecting a hydrogen bomb. The development caused global tensions to rise and put the U.S. on high alert. Aside from the devastation a nuclear weapon could cause, my next guest says, if used at the right place and altitude, electromagnetic energy could take virtually the entire U.S. off the electrical grid. Arizona Congressman Trent Franks is on the Armed Services Committee. He joins us now live. Good to see you, sir. Good to be here. Thank you. So what is your concern now with the launch that we saw today and the possible threat to the continental U.S. or, or really any U.S. Uh, territory? Well, it just seems like every day that passes, North Korea demonstrates a new capability. The one that you mentioned, uh, the potential hydrogen bomb or the, the warhead that would be a two-stage warhead, is something that I believe is, is an actuality. There are some who think that this is an enhanced uh, fission bomb, that it's not actually a fusion weapon. But that would mean that they'd have to use so much of their fissile material that that wouldn't probably be likely. And it was over 200 kilotons of yield, so this is a big bomb. And at the same time, they were the ones that uh, threatened to use it as an EMP uh, weapon, which would mean a high-altitude nuclear burst that would interact with the ionosphere and, and, and create a massive rush of ionized particles to the Earth, which could overload some of our most critical electrical components and put us in a, in a very bad situation without electricity. Yeah, I mean, that's, the, that's the potential. And talking about things that we deal with every day, that our society has become so dependent upon. Yes, I mean, everyday life, that would be devastating, uh, just that effect. I want to um, bring in something here that we heard from Senator Cardin, uh, ranking Democrat over uh, in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, about what he says about how we're handling North Korea. Here's his take. Diplomacy keeps us safe and allows us to use soldiers only when we need soldiers, and it has not received the priority it should under this administration. So what do you make of that? Well, you know, diplomacy is always heard in the shadow of, of military might and capability. And uh, the Clinton administration used so much diplomacy that uh, North Korea got nuclear weapons. And it's something that I think is laid uh, primarily on their doorstep. This administration has made it very clear to North Korea that there's a different uh, mindset in the White House. And I believe uh, that it's very important that North Korea and their leader, that uh, Mr. Kim Jong-un, understands that if they launch a nuclear weapon and it hits uh, civilian populations in the United States of America, that they will need a Geiger counter to find Pyongyang. And if they understand that, I believe that that's probably the kind of deterrent that this administration has made more credible that has the best chance of, of being able to prevent these kind of tragedies from occurring. What do you make of these discussions they're having on Capitol Hill, a hearing just days ago about whether or not our current president is capable of exercising control over our nuclear program. Here's a little bit of what Senator Chris Murphy, a Democrat out of uh, Connecticut, had to say about how he thinks about that issue. We are concerned that the president of the United States is so unstable, is so volatile, has a decision-making process that is so quixotic that he might order a nuclear weapons strike that is wildly out of step with U.S. national security interests. 
Is that something that worries you? Well, I, I just think that the comments of the gentleman there should be held in essential contempt because I think that he's deliberately trying to politicize the issue, that his real focus is not the, the equation that we face with North Korea. Uh, our uh, civilian military uh, command structure is firmly in place. And I have every conviction that this administration will act wisely. They certainly have so far. Uh, this president worked hard to get $4 billion additional uh, in the uh, defense budget uh, for missile defense. And I would just shamelessly use your television program, if I could here, to, to beg any relevant uh, people in the administration that are listening to go one step further now and to endorse a Section 1685 and 1688 in the National Defense Authorization Bill to help us build a space-based missile defense layer and a boost-phase uh, boost capability. If we had that now, Shannon, it would be a very different equation. We really wouldn't be in the kind of bind that we're in. I think that it will happen. Mike Pence is essentially overseeing that. I know that if he understands that, and I believe he will, that this will happen. But uh, this administration is doing things essentially about the best they can right now. And it's ironic. Uh, the detractors are the ones that put us in this position, and now they are trying to give this, uh, this administration a difficult time for having to deal with their mess. Well, today's launch opens up this conversation it all does. over again. So, uh, Congressman Franks, always great to have you. Thanks for coming Thank in you. tonight. Thank you. All right, coming up. The island paradise of Hawaii is going back to the future to prepare its citizens for the threat of a nuclear North Korea. The possibility of attack today is very remote, um, but we do believe that it's important that we be proactive. The increasingly ugly, often hysterical attacks on the women representing the Trump administration. Facing the possibility of a nuclear North Korea, Hawaii is bringing back a Cold War era early warning system to be used in the event of an impending missile strike. The attack warning tone, World War II era sirens, will be tested once a month beginning Friday. Trace Gallagher joins us live to tell us more. Hey, Trace. Hi, Shannon. You have to remember that almost 76 years after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the island of Oahu is still considered a likely target because, one, it's home to Honolulu, the state's largest city, and it remains the home of a massive concentration of the U.S. military command structure for the Pacific Theater. So in the event of an actual nuclear missile launch from North Korea, the U.S. Pacific Command would notify Hawaiian emergency authorities inside Berkheimer Tunnel. That's the emergency command center built into the side of a mountain. Mountain. Officials there would then sound the sirens. The hope is that Hawaiian residents and visitors would have between 12 and 15 minutes to take cover. The sirens would wail from 400 different locations across the island chain for 60 seconds, sounding like this. Listen. So this Friday, just before noon, the attack sirens will be fully tested for the first time in 30 years. The decision to restart the warning system was made before today's launch of an ICBM missile, but North Korea was always the motivating factor. Watch. It's not stopping. It's in our face. It's an elephant in the room. So when people say that we shouldn't prepare for this, it's not true. We should prepare for this unlikely emphasize that unlikely for many, many, many reasons, but we should be prepared. Yeah, Hawaii is home to one and a half million residents, and there is some concern that because of the vast number of visitors who come to Hawaii on an annual basis, that the monthly sirens will kind of scare a lot of people, which is why authorities plan to have hotels, radio, local television stations notify people well in advance. Here's Hawaii's governor on why it makes sense. A possibility of attack today is very remote, um, but we do believe that it's important that we be proactive, that we uh, plan and are prepared uh, for every um, possibility uh, moving forward. We should note that Hawaii doesn't have any designated nuclear shelters, but experts say just staying indoors would offer the best chance of limiting exposure to radioactive fallout. Not much of an aloha, Shannon, but someday could, could save a lot of lives. Yeah, Shannon. better to be ready. Trace Gallagher, thank you so much. Well, Kentucky Senator Rand Paul speaks out for the first time after a brutal attack that left him with serious injuries, much worse than initially reported. Fox News medical analyst Dr. Mark Siegel has the exclusive. 
Shannon, I sat down with Senator Rand Paul, doctor to doctor, to find out exactly what happened and why his neighbor attacked him outside his home earlier this month. I think my wife put it best when she said I sort of got assaulted twice, you know, once in my yard from somebody who attacked me from behind, but then the media who thought it was sort of funny or gleeful or that, you know, maybe I deserved it somehow. You were blindsided. I I, I was working in my yard with my earmuffs on, you know, to protect my hearing from the mower, and I'd gotten off the mower facing downhill, and the attacker came running full bleed. I never saw him, never had a conversation. In fact, the weird thing is I haven't talked to him in 10 years. Why? What, what was in his, do you have any idea what was in his head? Well, I didn't before the attack because we'd had no conversation. Um, after my ribs were broken, then he said things to me to try to indicate why he was unhappy. But I think the, um, I guess to me the bottom line is it isn't so important if, if someone mugs you, is it really justified for any reason? And so I think the more people belabored, oh, well, was it about yard clipping? Was it because he hates Donald Trump? Does he, he hates you because you oppose Obamacare? You don't really know what's in someone's mind. And so it may have some relevance, but for the most part, the real question should be, are you allowed to attack someone from behind in their yard when they're out mowing their grass, even if you dislike something about their yard? The senator suffered six severely broken ribs and contracted pneumonia from his injuries. Yet he returned to work last week to help push through the president's tax reform plan, which includes a Paul favorite, the individual mandate repeal. Shannon? Dr. Siegel, thank you so much. Coming up, new developments tonight in the showdown between Obama holdovers and Trump appointees. The judge's ruling, a critical one in this case, is next. Plus, it all started with evidence from a series of robberies, and now it's going all the way to the Supreme Court. It could change the way you use your cell phone forever. So we really do keep our most personal information on our cell phones with us, and the Supreme Court has been grappling, and this is a big case for them to grapple with how the Fourth Amendment applies in this modern age. A big win for the president in his showdown with Senator Elizabeth Warren and an Obama administration appointee over a controversial federal agency and who's really in charge of it late this afternoon. Judge Timothy Kelly said President Trump is the one who gets to decide who's actually running this agency. but. It's clear this fight is far from over. Former DOJ official Tom Dupree joins us now to break it down. Good to see you today. Good to see you, Shannon. All right, so we were talking about this last night. Who gets to decide? The guy who um, left, essentially, and he was controversial. Republicans and conservatives, for the most part, do not like this agency. Mick Mulvaney, who the president tapped to run it, says he wishes it didn't even exist. Yes. And now he's running. And today, the, the judge says... You're right. The president gets to decide, and Mick Mulvaney's in charge. Yes, and it doesn't surprise me that that's the decision the judge reached here. I mean, if you look at it, there are two conflicting laws here, or competing laws, I should say, and the judge simply said, I think the one that the administration is relying on is the one that really governs here. And for that reason, President Trump has the right to appoint the director of his own federal agency. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is what uh, Leandra English, uh, she is the, was the deputy director, tapped to be the acting director by the outgoing director. Um, she went to, she filed a lawsuit Sunday night saying, I'm the rightful person to run this agency. Here's what her attorney said about where this fight goes now. So what we want is a quick, speedy resolution of this controversy that can get up, um, up through the court system, can be appealed, because this court, I think this court understands, is not the final word on who is the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. There'll be appellate level next, and then ultimately the Supreme Court. Where do you think this thing goes? Well, I think it certainly will go up to the Court of Appeals. Now, if I were her lawyer, I don't know as a matter of litigation strategy if I would have told the trial judge, you don't matter because <laughs> right. we're going to the Court of Appeals. But it is true. He'll probably litigate it up to the Court of Appeals. He may try to get it into the Supreme Court, but I tend to doubt the Supreme Court's going to want to get anywhere near this case. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on another front, we have the special counsel, Mueller's team, now talking with Michael Flynn's legal team, and apparently um, they're cutting off communications, at least strategizing with the White House team. People say, 
that's what to be expected, especially if they're working on some kind of plea deal or something else. Does it surprise you? It, it doesn't surprise me, Shannon. I think that this is something that a lot of people expected would happen sooner or later. The fact that Flynn's people might be talking with Mueller or even entering plea negotiations with Mueller shouldn't shock anyone. And look, at the end of the day, even if Flynn does cooperate with Mueller, I think the big question here is, does Flynn have some sort of evidence that's going to inculpate the president? Because if the president and the campaign officials are all innocent of any collusion, then they have nothing to fear. And the fact that Flynn is cooperating doesn't matter at the end of the day. All right. Well, I quickly want to read you. Uh, there's been a lawsuit filed trying to get rid of uh, Special Counsel Mueller, overseeing this by Larry Klayman and Freedom Watch, a conservative group. He says Mr. Mueller and his team suffer from numerous conflicts of interest that not only mandate their removal, but also explain why the leaks are being disseminated to the media on a daily basis. Does the lawsuit go anywhere? Well, I would have to say probably not. I mean, look, no one should be leaking grand jury material. I mean, that's very, very important. The line you can never cross. That said, I don't know filing a lawsuit to try to get Mueller removed on that ground has a lot of legs. My guess is it might get some press attention and certainly will cause people to talk. But at the end of the day, I'd be surprised if a federal judge throws Mueller off of this case. I think you're right, but we'll keep an eye on it. Uh, Tom Dupree, thank you so much for coming. Thank in. you, Shannon. Good to see you. All right, coming up, they've been called liars, overweight, country bumpkins, and a whole lot worse. What about all these personal attacks against the women of the White House? What it tells us about the media elites of our country.